Our scriptures this morning is from Isaiah 43, verses 16 through 21, and Revelation 21, verses 1 through 7. This is what the Lord said. He who made a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters, who drew out the chariots and horses, the army and reinforcements together, and they lay there, never to rise again, extinguished, snuffed out like a wick. Forget the former things, do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up, do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. The wild animals honor me, the jackals and the owls, because I provide water in the desert and streams in the wasteland to give drink to my people, my chosen, the people I formed for myself, that they may, that they may proclaim my praise. And Revelation 21, 1 through 7. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the older order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all of this, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. The word of God for the people of God. Sadly, I got this great little gift, and my hand's just too big to fit it. It's the thought that counts, right? I, uh, I hope that if you're one who reads the bulletin and you look at that sermon snapshot, that you don't uh, take too much stock in it, because um, what I think I'm supposed to be talking about a month in advance when I create that, and then what God puts on my heart as I'm actually pulling the message together, they're, they're not always exactly the same. So if, if it strays a little bit and you were really looking forward to what that sermon snapshot said, I'm sorry. I might disappoint you today, but, but I think what I have to say today, I'm confident that it's what God uh, is wanting me to say and wanting you to hear. So I just put that out there for whatever it's worth. Um, if you've never seen our home, we're very blessed to live in a brick home. And it's one of the things that I love about our home. It's one of the things that drew me to it. I'm a huge fan of brick. And it faces the northeast. And so in the morning, as the sun rises, you know, the rays kind of come in through my living room window. And it's very peaceful and beautiful, aside from the little dust particles that you can always see floating in the, in the rays. Uh, but, but I always feel like it greets me, you know, for a new day. I come downstairs, and the sun is shining, and it's beautiful. But with that, because the house faces the northeast, that means that the back side of the house, which is also entirely brick, in the noon sun and in the evening is just blasted. And so you can imagine um, during the summertime how the heat just radiates off of that brick. Uh, any plants that we've tried to plant back there just scorch because the heat is that you can water them all you want. It doesn't matter. They just shrivel up and die, and it's really sad. And so for the first few years, that part of our house was really wasted space. 
Um, we had a little patio, and of course we've got a nice backyard for the kids to play, but it was just not a fun space to be because it was too hot. There was no shade. There was no place to get a reprieve from that. And so fortunately I married a man who is pretty handy with tools, and he's pretty good at planning things and visualizing spaces, and so he created a sanctuary for me back there. And we didn't know that that was what it was going to be when he created it, but that's what he did. And so he built a covered deck onto the back of our house that comes off from our dining room. And it's the perfect place to go outside in the morning in the stillness and drink hot coffee. And uh, it's the perfect place to watch the girls jumping on the trampoline or climbing across the monkey bars. And it's the perfect place for entertaining family and friends and going out there at night and just listening to the chatter, um, hearing the coyotes cry or hearing the owls out in the tree line. It really is just very, very peaceful. And it's my favorite place. And it's from this deck, from my sanctuary, that I am able to observe uh, the seasons pass. I'm able to see God's creation and how they respond to this changing of the seasons. And of course, as a kid, I thought there were two seasons, right? There was school season, and then there was not school season. And if you ask my husband, who's in a tree stand right now, there are three seasons. There's NASCAR season, there's mushroom season, and then there's deer season. Yes, so praying for some fruitful hunting because it's not been a fruitful week. Um, but from my deck, I, I can witness as one season transitions to another. And in the spring, I watch as the trees bud and, and tiny sprigs of green grass erupt from the ground. And... The farmer plows and plants the field next door, and there's a tiny little finch. Every year we get this little finch family, and they scavenge for things, and then they build a nest in one of my hanging plants every year, and I don't have the heart to not buy the plant because I know that little finch is counting on me to you know, have a safe place to lay her eggs, and so I get to watch them fly in and out. And in the summer, I sit on my deck sipping lemonade, Except that's a lie, because I, I don't sip lemonade, but um, it sounds romantic, doesn't it? <laughs> I'm supposed to be out there sipping lemonade on my deck, but I do. I watch my garden, and I observe my cucumber plants and how the green vines entangle in the fencing that we have put out there to support them. And I see the green leaves from our humongous ancient pecan tree, and it, it scrapes against the playset because it really needs to be cut back, and we don't have the heart to do it. And the baby finches, they've already strengthened their wings and flown away. And so I get to just enjoy my plant now. And then I see a sand burr or two, and I just sigh. Alex can deal with that. And then in the fall, right now, I sit out on my deck, and I watch the squirrels scurry about because our pecan trees are ripe for harvest right now. And so when I sit there, that you know, they're scurrying around, they're picking up pecans, the dog's chasing them, and we call him that he's on squirrel patrol, and so it's just a really fun sight. And I can look out at the tree line beyond our backyard, and the leaves are changing, and now they're starting to fall. And again, it's just a really beautiful time, but it's definitely a time of transition, definitely a time of change. And then in the winter, well, I look through the French doors and beyond the deck because it's cold outside in the winter, and I don't go out on my deck in the winter. But when I look through those doors, I can see blankets of snow on the trampoline and on the play set and on the, the field, and I can see icicles hanging down, and it's usually very still, not a whole lot going on. You know, the squirrels aren't really scattering. The birds aren't really around. Occasional blue jays, cardinals, maybe out there searching for something. But it's usually very, very still. And so I understand how the seasons work. You know, in, in seventh grade science, Mr. Hall, our science teacher, made sure that we knew that the sun and not our seventh grade egos was the center of the universe, <laughs> that everything revolved around the sun, not revolving around us. And we weren't so sure about that, but we said, okay, Mr. Hall. And I know that the earth spins on its axis, 
And so I know that with those two things combined, that sometimes the earth is closer to the sun and sometimes it's further from the sun and we have night and we have day and we have all of our seasons. And science tells me that. But I also know that God created those seasons because Genesis tells me that. And I can look to Genesis chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, and it tells me that God said... Let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from the night and let them serve as signs to mark seasons and days and years and let them be lights in the expanse of the sky to give light on earth. And so it was. And then in chapter 8, verse 22, God promises Noah, as long as earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. Science? Sure. God? Absolutely. And our natural seasons remind me that God created um, a rhythm for us, an order out of chaos. And it's a rhythm that makes sense because the seasons provide a time for rebirth and life in the spring, a time for warmth and growth in the summer, a time for harvest and reaping in the fall, and then a time of dormancy and rest in the winter because the earth is a living thing and it needs a time of dormancy and rest. It's what our earth needs to function, this cycle revolving around the sun and planting and reaping and, um, and resting and then starting all over again. And when I watch the squirrels and the birds and the insects and the plants as one season transitions to the other, I notice that they don't fight it. You know, I've never seen a squirrel out there going, Gah! Winter! They just do what they're supposed to do. Oh, it's fall. I'm going to gather the nuts. Oh, it's winter. I'm going to hibernate a little bit. Oh, it's spring. I'm going to go cause up some trouble. You know, they do what they were created to do in the season that they were created to do it in. Us, not so much. You ever done that? Yeah, I hope maybe it's just me. It's just me. I know. So a few years ago, I was making copies in the teacher's lounge, back when I was still crazy and worked with kids. And um, it was during one of those five-minute passing periods. And um, I typically tried not to do anything other than use the bathroom, because those were blessed times, and get done what I needed to get done between classes before another crazy crew came in. But I was making copies, and... Um, I was feeling particularly overwhelmed on this day, and a friend of mine came in, and she said, how are you doing today? And, you know, you always wonder when somebody asks you that, do they really want to know how I'm doing? Or is this the, I'm going to be kind and ask you, even though, ooh, this could get ugly. And I didn't normally, you know, pour out all my troubles in a five-minute passing period, but on this day, I just felt like I needed to. And so I kind of unloaded on her about um, I was overwhelmed. I was working on my master's work. I was raising two kids, and Alex was traveling a lot for his job. And my mom, thankfully, was living independently at the time, but that was all right in the midst of her cancer and, and all that goes along with that. And I just, you know, I was ready for the ball to drop. I was ready for all those plates that I'd been spinning frantically to just come crashing down on my head. And I let her know all of this. And in her wisdom, she said to me, Susan, this is just a season. You can get through anything for a season. And it was the best thing that she could have said to me in that moment. And maybe I was really naive, but I had never once thought about different stages of my life as being seasons. You know, quite frankly, everything felt like it was going to last forever. That I was never going to get relief from whatever situation it was, that I was never going to find peace from whatever I was going through, that whatever relationship was torn and broken was never going to be restored, and that it was just going to last forever. And she said it's just a season. Did I particularly enjoy that season? No. Did I get through that season? I did. And if I were to create a timeline of my life, 
Uh, and I actually had our confirmands do this, creating a timeline of, of kind of the highs and lows. I would notice that it, it looks crazy if I were to do like a, you know, a, a graph of them. And theirs were kind of like that too. But I can find patterns. I can find periods of growth and renewal. I can find periods of harvesting and reaping. And I can find periods of dormancy and rest and waiting. I see all of those seasons in my life. Do you see those patterns too? I hope you do. I hope I'm not the only one. The problem, and I suspect, I suspect, again, this is only me. I can only speak for myself. But the problem is that I, I'm pretty comfortable with the status quo. Like, even if status quo isn't great, I'll keep it. Because, man, you throw some other plan in there, and I don't know what to do with that. That makes me uncomfortable. I mean, transition, change. Whew, I just got used to where I was right now, and now you want to move me forward? Oh, I don't know about that be uncomfortable. But what I have found is that so often the seasons of life that have impacted me the most and that have grown me the most when my relationship to God has deepened the most have been those seasons of pain or seasons of heartache, the ones that I didn't want to go through more than any other. And it seems that God uses not only natural seasons to restore the earth, but it occurs to me now that he uses them to restore our relationship with him. I love when in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 7, he says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. How very, very true for us. And I can find that this reality is also very present in the lives of our biblical characters. You can look to multiple characters and see that their lives went through seasons as well. And one that has really um, intrigued me and really spoken to me is David. This humble shepherd boy, the youngest in a clan of eight strapping boys. He's the sensitive one. He's the artistic one. Probably a little bit naive. The one least likely to be chosen as the future king. But he is exactly the one that God chooses. And David's story shouldn't be complicated, right? I mean... Hello, he was chosen by God to be a king. So wouldn't you anticipate that that transition from 15-year-old shepherd boy to king of Israel, man, smooth sailing, right? He was chosen by God. Shouldn't it just be a natural progression? I would think if God determined this, if it's God's choice, that it's going to be from David's own bloodline that God's son is going to come to earth to save us all, shouldn't it be an easy path for David? Roll out the red carpet. Special treatment, fine dining. Here you go, David, here's your crown on a platter. Didn't exactly work that way. It's not how it happens. And instead, we see that David's story is one of jealousy and spite and fear and terror and being a fugitive. And we see God intentionally place David in Saul's court, who was then the king, who had lost favor with God because he was just a bad dude and one doing anything that he was supposed to be doing. And David is the only one who can drive away this evil spirit that God's had plaguing Saul. And so David, this young boy, becomes Saul's personal musician. 
and his armor bearer. And yeah, you know, he's, he's moving up. He's out here in front of the court now. He's been kind of taken in by this family. We think, woohoo, way to go, David. Smooth transition. But then we see God empowering David at a young age, too young to even be a soldier, to go out and stand before a Philistine giant and kill him with a slingshot and a stone simply because he believed that God would enable him to be able to do it, and he did. And how do the people respond? Yeah, we love you, David. We love you better than Saul. Ooh, not so good. Smooth sailing for David? Not anymore. Because Saul's jealous. And Saul doesn't like this. And Saul is threatened. And Saul doesn't see the divine appointment in David that a lot of the other people were able to see. And so ultimately, to make a long story shorter, um, we start a game of cat and mouse, a game of hide and seek, a game of peekaboo, as David recognizes eventually, after Saul tries to kill him 12 times within two chapters of 1 Samuel, this is maybe not the best environment for me. And he flees. He runs. And I can't help but wonder if somewhere in David's mind, you know, as he's running and he's doing all this, he's thinking, um, hello, God? Is it time to be king yet? (laughs) Because I'm running, and my life is being threatened, and you chose me, and yet you're not giving me a smooth path to get there. What's going on? That's what I would think that he would say. And if you know the story, you know that ultimately there is no reconciliation between David and Saul. We know that twice God put Saul at the mercy of David. And everybody was saying, David, just kill him. Here's your chance. You know, he's been chasing you. He's been hounding you. He hates you and everybody knows it. Just kill him. Because God anointed him, God appointed him, when it's my time, it'll be my time. And he doesn't take advantage of the opportunity. We know that ultimately, uh, David landed in the land of the Philistines, where Saul could no longer pursue him, because he wasn't in Israel anymore. And eventually, Saul took his own life. Things, things took a turn the way that um, God intended for them to turn. And Saul is no longer a personal threat to David. And although David doesn't yet step in as king of Israel, there's still some time before that's going to happen, we could say that David probably entered into a new season of his life, a new season of moving towards becoming king. And, and maybe David never asked God why. Why did you anoint me at 15? only to send me through the ringer, God. I was happy tending my daddy's sheep, composing my music, hanging out in the fields, and then wham, you come in and wreck everything. You change everything. Why? You ever feel that way? Perfectly content with where you are until wham, he throws something at you and it changes everything throws you into a season of change and molding, or maybe, almost even worse, a a season of dormancy and waiting. Sometimes those are the worst, aren't they? The waiting. The waiting. But if we look at what happens to David and through David in that season of his life, when he's running and when he's waiting, we see how powerfully God was actually at work. Because it's during this time that that David delivers the people of Keilah from the Philistines. He's doing God's work. And it's during the days that he spends at Ziklag that he continually carries out raids against the enemies of Israel. He's doing God's work. And he shares a portion of the spoils with the people of the cities of Judah. He's doing God's work in that time. And it appears that he may even end up fighting for the Philistines for his enemies. But God removes him from that picture. So again, he's not the one who kills Saul. He's not the one who kills um, God's anointed. And so over time and over time and over time, 
we see that it's through this experience that God is further developing David to become the king that God needs him to be. That he's further developing his military prowess. That he's further developing his ability to identify whom he can and cannot trust because he's betrayed multiple times in this process as well. It's during this time that he's further developing David's dependence on God rather than on his own abilities, further developing David's sense of faith and obedience, his patience. All of these qualities that David is going to need to be a faithful, obedient servant to his God and to his people. It doesn't make David perfect. Hello, Bathsheba. Another story. I'm not going to go there today. But it does help to groom him into the leader that God intends for him to be. And fortunately, we have the Psalms, which provide a record for us of David's response to these seasons. And I love reading the Psalms because they remind me that David was human and I'm human and man, I can see so much of myself in what David says. And I want to share just a couple of them with you because I can turn to Psalm 8 and I can see where David is at a season in his life where he's happy. And I, I don't know when he wrote this one. I wonder if it was maybe in his younger days. I can imagine this, this shepherd boy composing this psalm. And he says, Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. From the lips of children and infants you have ordained praise because of your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him? The son of man that you care for him. You made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet, all flocks and herds and the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Praise God. Praise God. And there are a lot of psalms like that. But then I also find psalms from David that clearly show distress that clearly show fear, that clearly show heartache. And in Psalm 64, he says, Hear me, O God, as I voice my complaint. God. Just imagine him. Protect my life from the threat of the enemy. Hide me from the conspiracy of the wicked, from that noisy crowd of evildoers. They sharpen their tongues like swords and aim their words like deadly arrows. They shoot from ambush at the innocent man. They shoot at him suddenly without fear. They encourage each other in evil plans. They talk about hiding their snares. They say, who will see them? They plot injustice and say, we have devised a perfect plan. Surely the mind and heart of man are cunning. But God will shoot them with arrows. Suddenly they will be struck down. He will turn their own tongues against them and bring them to ruin. All who see them will shake their heads in scorn. All mankind will fear. They will proclaim the works of God and ponder what he has done. Let the righteous rejoice in the Lord and take refuge in him. Let all the upright in heart praise him. And so we see him in, in his fear. He's being hunted down. He's afraid. He's afraid for his life. And yet, even in kind of sending up that complaint, save me, why is this happening? He recognizes, and I trust you, God. You're going to come through for me. He can handle our complaints. And then just one more that I want to share with you, and this is one of my personal favorites. Psalm 40, he turns to God and he recognizes what God has done in his life and what God has done in his suffering. And he says, I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust, 
who does not look to the proud, to those who turn aside to false gods. Many, O Lord my God, are the wonders you have done. The things you planned for us, no one can recount to you. Were I to speak and tell of them, they would be too many to declare. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but my ears you have pierced. Burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not require. Then I said, here I am, I have come. It is written about me in the scroll. I desire to do your will, O oh my God. Your law is within my heart. And he continues on. But that gratitude, that praise, you saw me through my most difficult times. You lifted me out of the pit of despair. You lifted me out of the muck and the mire. You set my feet upon a rock. And we know what David's been through. And to still have that gratitude. Do we have that gratitude? And what I love about it is that the Psalms and David's story clearly show me that I'm not alone in going through seasons, in going through the ups and the downs of life. But what I think does set David apart for me is in how I respond to it. Because the Psalms show me what it looks like to turn to the Lord in every season of life, to be a man or a woman truly after God's own heart, as Paul describes him. To seek the Lord instead of stomping my foot and raising my fist and pouting because I'm in an uncomfortable season. To see the Lord in times of prosperity instead of acting like I've done any of it on my own. To seek the Lord in times of dormancy and waiting. Trusting. Trusting. In the next step. To rest in the declaration that, that God is making all things new and all for his glory and if there's anybody in the world who has my best interest at heart and your best interest at heart it's God it's God just a couple more things as, as we wrap up today you know we're moving into another kind of season in November and December the holiday season it's kind of its own beast isn't it because you're in whatever season you're in, and then the holidays come, and let's put on our masks. We're in the midst of making travel plans. We're frantically trying to clean our house so that Great Aunt Ruthie doesn't know that we live in a pigsty and that the cat actually drinks out of the faucet. <laughs> True story at my house. Uh, when we're crammed around the table, and somebody inevitably knocks over the gravy, or a glass of milk, and Grandma's house is 80 degrees because it just always is 80 degrees in Grandma's house. And the dogs are hiding under the table waiting for just one person to drop a crumb, and we're knocking elbows, and then we're gonna rush out to go get our Christmas shopping done and find the perfect gift for everybody on our list because even though we don't have the money, we have to keep up the pretense that we do. It's exhausting. And according to my Pinterest boards, the holidays should not look like this. And maybe you're one of those people who does like handmade placemats and, you know, makes a little thankful tree. And God bless you if you are. Can I come and take lessons from you? Because that does not happen at our house. And the reality, what I find the most difficult about the holidays is that the holidays force us to recognize where we have strained relationships, where we have broken relationships, where we have missing relationships, because, you know, it's a time of togetherness. A lot of togetherness. And so we get to spend the next two months plastering a smile and surviving this togetherness, surviving the next two months of pretending like our marriages are really happy and strong so that nobody else in the family realizes that it's a war zone in our home. This togetherness that forces us to pretend for the next two months like it's okay that we haven't spoken to our siblings for the last six months, let's all gather around the table and share a meal. This togetherness that forces us to pretend in front of everybody else that we don't scream at our children when they misbehave, when in fact we do. The next two months 
of pretending like our hearts aren't tearing inside because of the codependent relationship that we have with our own parents. The next two months of pretending like we're not still grieving the one whose seat is empty, even though everybody thinks that we should have moved on by now. It's a lot of togetherness. And how do we get through the holiday season when I would bet that there is at least one relationship in your life right now that you are going to have to come face to face with that is broken or that is strained or that is uncomfortable and you feel like you are in a season of being broken and a season of pain a season of being uncomfortable and you might not have Saul chasing you down in a cave with a spear but you might have somebody whose tongue is a spear who uses their words as a weapon against you, or who uses their silence as a weapon against you. And you're going to have to come face to face with that. And you might feel like David, ready to flee from the madness, get away just to survive these next two months. And I can tell you that because I'm the same way, because I feel it. And so what do we do with this? What do I do with this? And what I want to do with this is I want to have a heart like David. I want my appropriate response in whatever season of life I'm in, in whatever season of parenthood I'm in, in whatever season of my marriage I'm in, in whatever season of my ministry that I'm in. I want my response to be one of praise and thanksgiving and joy to the Lord who sees me and knows me, who carries me through my hardships, who works everything together for my good and for his glory, because that's what David shows me. When we're facing our giants, we praise and we glorify God. When we're happily in love and content, we praise and we glorify God. When we're fleeing from danger and betrayal, Guess what? We praise and we glorify God. When we're faced with a decision of whether or not to lash back at the one who has harmed us, we praise and we glorify God. And in that, our situation may not change. Our relationship may not change. Our job may not change. But we will change. Our perspective will change. And God will whisper to our heart, I've got this. I've got you. Change is good. This season is for your good. And I am good.